was um, a fantastically varied life. He was born in 1819. He died in 1901, same birth and death years as Queen Victoria. The parks were his first public activity. He collected in the end equivalent of a million pounds, bought three plots of land, handed it over to Manchester Council and Salford Council. Then he got into railways, Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway. He was headhunted to go out to Canada because the biggest railway company in Canada had gone virtually bankrupt. He pulled it round in two years, got it into a profit, extended it. Filled with enthusiasm, he decided to dig a channel tunnel. Got two miles, the government took fright because they thought the dastardly French would invade through it and uh, they stopped him. He then went on to build an Eiffel Tower in Wembley. That got 155 feet up, electric lifts, it was magnificent, it was going to be the tallest building in the whole world. He was born in Salford. His father, Absalom, was a reformer. He hated being in the centre of Manchester because Manchester was a magnificent place for wealthy people. It was fantastic, the money that there was. But for ordinary people, it was an absolute hellhole. Absalom couldn't stand working and living in the middle of Manchester. So he bought Rose Hill in Northern and, and that's where Edward grew up. But as a youngster, there's no doubt at all, he was very reform-minded. The way in which people lived and died in Manchester moved him greatly. That was the start of his public career, leading a campaign in Manchester and Salford, which had no public open spaces at all. He began the campaign in 1844. The three parks were all opened in 1846. It would be nice to say that the railways are in his blood because his father took him to see the first passenger railway going from Liverpool to Manchester. But I'm afraid the reason why he got into railways was far more mundane. It was the boom industry and it was a way of making money. He was so sparky, so independent, so full of energy that uh, he didn't get on with his father. He also went into the trains to get away from his father's cotton warehouse. In his diary he says, I'm going to have a life of calico and nothing else. Well, he couldn't stand that thought. In one day, in the middle of what was called railway mania, there were over 600 bills presented in the House of Commons for new railway companies one day. He did his apprenticeship in the Trent Valley Railway. He went to work for the London North Western Railway, which is now the West Coast Main Line. He was headhunted from there to become the secretary of the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway. That was a very go-ahead railway. His salary depended on his success and he made a tremendous success of it. So he became known and that was where they headhunted him to go out to sort out the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada. He was an incredible traveler. A journey across the Atlantic was 10 days top speed. He made, I think, 15 journeys. So he went out to Canada and spent months sorting things out and then coming back. Of course, by then they had telegraph. So he was able to organize a lot from this country. Apart from being called the Railway King, his more normal title was the Railway Doctor because he would cure sick lines. 
but he was a brilliant manager. His job was to rescue this railway. While he was coming and going to Canada, he met the Duke of Newcastle, who was the colonial secretary. The two men hit it off together, and the Duke of Newcastle asked Edward Watkin if he would get involved in negotiations to get a united dominion of Canada. And the key, as far as Watkin was concerned, was they wanted to have a railway which would go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Watkin was negotiating with the premiers of all these provinces. He was negotiating with the Chancellor of the Exchequer in London. If you look at the map of Canada in the 1860s, you will see that there is British Columbia on the Pacific side. Most of the provinces were on the Atlantic seaboard. In between an enormous area owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. They didn't want anybody else to have anything to do with it because they got a nice little corner, thank you. He wouldn't give up. He persuaded international businessmen to put up an enormous sum of money. They bought the land and he was then able to construct the railway line through it. He was an amazingly visionary person. When he took over the chairmanship of companies, he had ambitious plans. Let's take the most extraordinary one. The Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire joined with another company that he'd become chairman of, the Metropolitan. And that was to join with the Southeastern Railway. The plan was to go from Manchester to Paris without getting your feet wet. And that was where the Channel Tunnel came in. He began digging in 1880. He chose a spot at Shakespeare Cliff between Folkestone and Dover, which is where the present tunnel is. He got two miles. The French got a mile and a half. He used to take people down on freebies to the tunnel, to, to the entrance to the tunnel, which had potted palms, electric lights, plenty of hospitality. And at one time, it became part of the London scene. But unfortunately, the establishment was frightened to death because at the time, France had been this country's enemy for hundreds of years. They really genuinely thought that the French would invade through it. In 1920-odd, Marshal Foch, a French general, but by then we were friendly with the French, said, if we'd only had a channel tunnel in 1914, the British could have transported heavy armaments through the tunnel and the First World War would have been shortened by two years. He managed to get the Great Central Railway built. 1899, when he was desperately ill, was the official opening at Marylebone Station. He was in a wheelchair, having had heart attacks. He had these great gusts of imagination and vision, and he started on this tower, which was a, a marvellous concept. You go to Wembley now and you think, well, you know, it's built up, but it was the middle of nowhere. So he had this idea of buying an enormous park and putting up an Eiffel Tower in it. But that's the early 1890s. It got 155 feet up with an electric lift to the first platform. The views were fantastic from up there. He planned to have three platforms with Turkish baths, restaurants, observatories. 
it was really lavish. But the money ran out, and before the money ran out, incredibly, it began to sink. It was a disaster. It failed. Watkins Folly was the name that it was known by. He said, when it's built, it will be its own advertisement. And it was, but not in the way he intended. He was an action man. He loved new enterprises, challenges. I think at the end of his life, he was unfulfilled and very sad. The tunnel had been laughed at. The tower had been laughed at. He came home to Northern. Then he retired from his directorships, his chairmanships. He retired basically from public life. They called him Nimble Ned. He was lightning quick and he would go for gold. And that must have meant a lot of people bounced off the wagon as they were going along. He wasn't, I think, loved. Once he began to fail, people laughed at him and then forgot him. On his death, he was briefly remembered. There were over a 100 obituaries in newspapers throughout the world. But after that, he disappeared. At his funeral, not a single person from Manchester Council came. This man is worth remembering. Tunnel, Wembley Tower, Canada, Parks, Great Central Railway, all the other railways as well. All his brilliant schemes abroad and in Britain. And we're doing our best.